Okay, so I think we can get started. Uh, thank you all for joining uh, this winter morning, I would say. And uh, our speaker for today is uh, uh, Milan Karsik. So Milan is an assistant scientist from Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science. And, and today he is going to present on ARC momentum transfer in extreme wind condition. All right, thank you, Masur. Um, and thank you everybody for having me and for uh, joining my presentation. So the title of my talk is Air Sea Momentum Transfer in Extreme Wind Conditions. That's, um, that's the title of, my of our main project we're working on now and the general theme. And in this talk, I'll zoom in into uh, specific uh, topics under that umbrella. And uh, so my, the, the first half of the talk will be our uh, recent development on the project and in the second half I'll I'll demo a few of new and ongoing projects that are uh, somewhat adjacent uh, to this one and I think should be interested interesting uh, to the audience so I um, like Mansur said I'm an assistant scientist at uh, UM um, a member of the sustain lab which is headed by professor Brian house uh, he's my main boss um, I also work uh, uh, in smaller part with uh, Professor Claire Paris, um, also from, from um, UM, and a lot of this work was really supported by over a dozen uh, staff, so postdocs, um, PhD students, and undergraduate students uh, who helped on the projects. Uh, just a short summary of my um, academic journey. So I studied meteorology um, for an undergrad in University of Belgrade, that's in Serbia. It's where I grew up. And University of Belgrade is most known for, um, for their team that developed uh, at the time known, so in the late 70s, it was called HIBU, uh, a regional weather prediction model that was in, I believe, 1978 acquired along with the team uh, by NSEP which became the ETA model, which was um, the operational regional model for, um, that, that was the NAM at the time until early 2000s. And that model has also evolved, evolved to uh, what's now WARF NMM, uh, which is still um, operational uh, regional model at, um, at NSEP. And so basically it's, it's there that I got uh, really interested in numerical weather prediction, numerical methods um, and model development. There was a lot of uh, focus on that, but I was really uh, interested a lot in ocean um, and waves, um, surfing. Uh, there's no surfing in Serbia, but I was, um, I was watching a lot of movies um, about surfing. Uh, so that got me into um, looking into grad schools um, in US, uh, that brought me in 2009 um, to, into the PhD program at UM uh, with Shui Chen. Uh, so that was a very um, exciting, interesting time for me. Um, I, was, I was part of a bigger uh, NOP project um, that also Tetsu and uh, Isaac and their students uh, were involved. It was a big multi-team project focused on couple model development, uh, especially um, focusing on wind wave uh, and wave current coupling for hurricane uh, applications. So I um, proceeded with the postdoc, uh, stay with Shui when she moved to uh, UW. Um, I continued working with her though remotely, uh, still from Florida. And in 2018, I joined the Sustain Lab uh, with Brian House, uh, and I am still there. Uh, working on our main project that I'll discuss and a few others. I also just published uh, a book on Fortran programming. Uh, it's a hands-on textbook. Um, I mention it here because um, I know that there's uh, quite a few people um, uh, here uh, working on model development. Uh, most climate, ocean, uh, weather, wave models are implemented in Fortran. Um, so it may be used has uh, provided uh, five, uh, five free ebook copies for five lucky students on the seminar. And I believe Mansur will. Um, yeah, so the, by the, the end of the seminar, the 
right uh, so basically the the book is very practical. It guides you through um, various uh, hands-on projects. The long-running example is uh, shallow water equation solver, which is often taught in um, uh, numerical methods uh, class in oceanography and meteorology programs, but also some others like um, weather and wave buoy, um, series analysis, stock price analysis, um, and a few others. Okay, so the general theme of my research is on measuring and parameterizing air sea drag um, for hurricane prediction. And the general questions are, can we measure drag in hurricane winds? Uh, it's, it's very difficult, as we'll see. What physical processes govern the drag? And how can we better resolve it in models to improve hurricane prediction? What is air sea surface drag? So um, I'll try to use my mouse. Do you see my mouse pointer? Yeah, well, we can see. Okay, great, thanks. So, uh, air sea drag is the vertical flux uh, of horizontal momentum between atmosphere and ocean. So it's uh, horizontal momentum of moving down or up uh, from atmosphere into ocean or from ocean into atmosphere, that happens also. It is largely surface wave dependent and very difficult to measure in extreme weather such as hurricanes. So this photo on the right is, um, from a um, NOAA aircraft uh, reconnaissance uh, mission. And so what you see is the sea surface in tropical storm force winds. Uh, you have uh, white caps here in white so that you get white caps when you have breaking waves. And that's the foam that's uh, uh, lingering on the surface. You also have in a little bit um, kind of bluish, uh, bluish white, you see some foam under the surface, so bubbles get um, injected into the subsurface ocean. Uh, as waves break, they eject droplets uh, into the air, and those droplets are being carried by the wind, so that's what we call sea spray. And if you look further up uh, toward the horizon, you see how it gets, um, um, it has very low visibility, and that's, it's not fog, it's from, from sea spray. Uh, and so generally, these are uh, very violent conditions. Um, oh yeah, another, another approach that I'd like to emphasize is also that when you get uh, a steep breaking waves, not only the crashing of the waves is that it drags the droplets, but also wind can uh, tear off uh, water from, from tips of wave crests. And that uh, generates larger droplets, um, uh, which we generally refer to as spume. And this, this process and parameterizing it correctly in models is essential uh, for improving weather and ocean prediction, especially in the, in the couple context. Uh, so I mentioned hurricanes a lot and that's the main theme. Uh, what happens to drag in strong winds? In early 2000s, there were two somewhat independent but not all the way independent studies from the field and from the laboratory found that drag saturates in strong winds. So this is from uh, Mark Powell's and colleagues paper. Uh, and the data is basically from uh, GPS drop zones, drop from aircraft into hurricanes. Uh, they assume a, a log profile uh, in, in, the, in the boundary layer and they compute uh, the stress in that way. And uh, so they find uh, sign of saturation, perhaps even a decrease. Um, however, I'd like to point out that in these uh, very high winds, there is high uncertainty in the data. Uh, and also it, there is uncertainty associated with the method. Uh, there's, it's, it's far from a direct measurement and there's quite a few assumptions that go into it that get you from the raw data of a falling drop zone to this plot. Uh, and Mark Donlan and colleagues uh, in 2004, uh, at, so this is a, from a study from UM, uh, <coughs> the ACES laboratory. So ACES laboratory was the predecessor to the SUSTAIN laboratory that I'm a member uh, today. Uh, so they use multiple methods in the tank and they, they found that as, as wind speed in, increases, you get saturation at, at about uh, low 30, 
low 30s uh, meter per second. So basically the drag flattens out. So what is drag coefficient? Exactly, it relates wind stress uh, to the wind speed squared. So it just gives you a relationship given uh, this wind speed, you'll have this much stress, this much momentum exchange between atmosphere and ocean. So that's in high winds, that's atmosphere losing momentum in the surface layer, and that's ocean, and specifically ocean waves uh, and subsurface currents gaining momentum. And this was a high impact result because soon after, like within a few years, it was implemented in weather and ocean prediction models, uh, specifically uh, still the most widely used uh, weather prediction model, WARF. Uh, that was implemented as the recommended tropical uh, cyclone setting. So for, for, for hurricane applications, I was recommend that you use this. And this was in, actually it still is for that setting, it's, uh, it's still an active setting. Uh, the default is a little bit different, but, but uses also the same level of uh, saturation. Now emphasis a little bit uh, more very soon why that matters. Um, I'm going to review physical processes a little bit. Um, why does drag saturate in strong winds? Uh, and there are a few hypotheses. One is uh, the sheltering and flow separation. So this is uh, from uh, particle image velocimetry uh, work in the laboratory by Buckley and Veron. And uh, what, so they imaged airflow over water surface. Uh, in very low wind, you have uh, almost no waves, and this is what the airflow looks like. Uh, and as waves get um, higher and steeper, you start developing this uh, sheltering uh, zone in, in front of the wave crest. And that's especially pronounced in this uh, image of a very, very steep wave. So this on the panels are equivalent U10 of about one meter per second, five meter per second, and 14 meter per second winds. And here in 14 meter, meter per second winds, what you see here is that the flow basically, it doesn't follow the surface, but it sort of continues on above this sheltered area. And uh, it's hypothesized that this flow can, uh, when waves are steep enough and when wind is high enough, it can skip from crest to crest. So effectively, the wind doesn't feel the roughness of the dominant waves anymore, and that limits or decreases uh, the drag. And I mentioned earlier, there's um, wave tearing from direct impact by wind. This is from um, uh, Holtuysen and colleagues. Uh, Mark Powell was also on this team, and they use the same same day, same drops on data um, as the Powell 2003 study. In addition, they also uh, used photographs uh, from aircraft reconnaissance, which they analyzed and they segregated into clear surface, white cap, and streak categories. So streaks are, um, so they differentiate streaks from white, white caps and streaks are this, um, is the spume that is being carried by the wind uh, when, uh, when wind by direct force uh, basically trashes the top of the wave crest and carries that water forward. And uh, basically they look at how, how these vary with uh, wind speed and if there is a re relationship with drag. And they found that although the, the so the white cap uh, ratio actually stays relatively low, it's the streaks uh, that increase all the way to full coverage. And full coverage is uh, what they refer to as a complete whiteout. Uh, basically, when you look at the surface, it's, you, you don't see individual waves. It's, it's almost white. It's a, it's a complete mess. And uh, basically, th then they looked at the, the drag and they found that the drag decreases at about the same um, same conditions when uh, you have this 
white up and they, they propose that as uh, uh, as a as a possible dominant mechanism for saturation or drag decrease and there's also a series of studies um, about the role of spray in uh, in the surface layers so basically when waves break they eject, uh, eject uh, droplets into the air uh, that spray can stay in the surface layer to, so to be suspended and carried uh, carried by wind. And what that hypothesis is to do is to uh, limit the energy of uh, of turbulent eddies in the air at at the various scales that uh, that contribute to stress. So similar to uh, to this process of um, of spume and streaks, basically the the spray acts as like a it's like a blanket over a rough wavy surface and effectively smooth smooth smoothens it but it smooths it by prohibiting uh, certain scales of uh, uh, air turbulent eddies okay so i'll move on to um, key objectives of my project um, with brian house and so the, the first step uh, in our project is to uh, repeat uh, the experiment of Don 2004 in the same tank to try to reproduce um, his results. And the main purpose of that is uh, so that we can validate the method. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, describe uh, the key method of momentum budget in the tank that was used in that study uh, because we want to apply that method in the new and large uh, sustained wind wave tank. Uh, so now the Sustain Lab has the ACES tank, which is a smaller tank, and that's the same tank that uh, Mark Donlan and team did their study in. Uh, and the Sustain tank is uh, considerably larger. Uh, it allows for stronger winds, so we can go all the way um, to Category 5 equivalent hurricane winds. And we can also generate all kinds of uh, paddle waves with directional spreading uh, with the prescribed uh, spectra. So it gives a lot more possibilities uh, to explore these questions. What happens to waves uh, and stress in very high winds? And then the, uh, the final objective of the project is to formulate a new wave growth function to resolve processes that govern drag in extreme winds. And what that means is really not to come up with a new thing, but to uh, generalize and expand uh, existing wave growth functions so that they account for these processes that are not uh, represented by wave or weather models. So uh, things like uh, spray generation, spume, uh, we, we see that the wind uh, can tear off uh, tips of wave crests uh, by direct impact. And at that point you have wind applying force to dissipate waves and not just to grow them. So we need to rethink how we implement source functions in wave models. And the, the first part of this um, work has been published. Uh, this, this paper is open access. So I'll discuss the key results here, uh, but you, you can go and read it uh, after the talk if you'd like. I mentioned the momentum budget method to estimate the drag in the laboratory. Uh, the key the um, importance of this method is that in high winds, uh, conventional uh, methods to measure flux uh, stop working because of spray and, and very violent conditions. So uh, typically we use uh, sonic anemometers uh, to get very high, high frequency fluctuations of velocity, which give, give us uh, turbulence and stress properties through eddy covariance. However, as soon as you get spray uh, moving through uh, the control volume of the instrument, because of how it works and the assumptions it makes, it just you, you start getting garbage, garbage data. So uh, Mark Dolan uh, pioneered this method um, of momentum budget with laboratory. So you, you start with, uh, with the momentum equation for, for the water in the tank. So you have uh, the usual suspects, uh, tendency advection, you have wave radiation stress term. Uh, so that's the momentum being uh, propagated by waves uh, 
because you have not just uh, the mean water moving with its uh, with its current, but you also have waves which carry some which carry some momentum forward. And then you have on on the right hand side the pressure gradient uh, term, both uh, in water and air, and the surface stress. So we are after this term. Now. Uh, because we are in the tank and we have control conditions, we can establish steady state by simply running uh, the wind tunnel and uh, for a certain time until we get steady state. We can assume that the direction is relatively small and doesn't uh, play an important role here. So what we're left with is we need to measure wave radiation stress uh, and pressure gradient terms. Now, when you unpack this and a sort of um, finite difference, uh, this term, you can put wind or uh, air, sea or ocean stress on this, how, however you wanna call it, on this side. And then you need to measure mean surface slope, pressure gradient in the air, uh, wave radiation stress and bottom stress. So if, if we can measure these four, then we can back out uh, the, the air side stress. So this is the same equation as uh, in the previous slide. What I added here is just this uh, conceptual diagram of a box of what it looks like. So when you imagine this is our tank and we have uh, wind blowing from left to right, that wind will apply stress to the water. It will generate waves. And there, there will be net momentum and mass moving from left to right. So that will establish a mean gradient in the water level. It also, that mean gradient also establishes some backflow. Uh, however, it, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't have to worry about that uh, simply, simply because um, it, it doesn't factor into uh, our equation. Uh, because that's, uh, uh -huh, go ahead. Yeah. Is it okay if we interrupt you with questions? I think so, yeah. Um, so the reason that you have a mean sea surface slope is because you're in a tank? Yes. So um, water, so the water volume is conserved. It doesn't leave the tank. Okay. Yeah. So, in, yeah. In the open ocean, you wouldn't have this term, right? That's correct. You could have it if you, when you have wind um, blowing on shore. Yeah. You, you can have a level, level setup. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and here these two dots um, are basically telling you that you need to measure things at two sections in the tank. And ideally you want to cover a representative uh, width of the area. Uh, so the closer they are, uh, the higher the air you get because your delta X uh, decreases. Uh, but to get these terms, all we have to measure is air pressure and water surface elevation at high frequency at these control sections. So from high frequency surface elevation, we can simply get the mean to get the mean water level, and then we can get the wave properties from the high frequency part. This is what a setup looks like in practice. Um, the top panel is uh, the diagram of, of the tank. It's to scale. So the tank is about 15 meters long. It has a porous beach uh, at the end. Porous beach acts to uh, dissipate waves as much as possible. You want to dissipate waves at the end because you don't want waves reflecting back of a vertical wall. It's porous because you also don't want shoaling. Um, and plunging, breaking of waves. You want them to uh, dissipate as, uh, as, as calmly as possible. Uh, wind goes in through here. We have a wave paddle here, uh, which we can use to, uh, to generate waves. I'll focus mostly on wind only experiments here. And there are two setups here. In black are the original 2004 by Mark Donlan instrument setup and in red are our new setup and so th having that laid out and being able to compare them is important because 
recall what I said about measuring these things at these two sections and basically you're when you measure things at two sections you're representing the the area in between uh, so uh, in the 2004 experiment the the pressure gradient was measured uh, over this section the water elevation was measured over this section um, ideally you want them all together in the same place however in practice and because of how you can uh, access the tank, where you can drill holes, where you can attach things. Not everything is possible, so you do your best. Uh, in our experiment, we have pressure gradient and um, pressure gradient at the these uh, sections, indicated with circles, and squares indicate where we have water elevation measurements. In uh, X is our a uh, hot film anemometer that's basically a very fine scale high frequency um, velocity and turbulence measurement oops uh, let me go back i revealed my data prematurely okay uh star is an uh, is a sonic anemometer uh, and we also had a Nortec Victrino, which give, gives us a um, high frequency water velocity measurement uh, and we use it to get the bottom stress. We also had uh, side camera imaging. So maybe better way to see that is from this uh, photograph of the tank below. So we illuminated the water column from the rear of the tank. And then we film at high frequency uh, the, the wavy interface from the side. So this is one camera uh, that we used, but we have three of those. At the deep, and they filmed these sections on the tank uh, indicated by uh, the pink squares. They are each about two meters wide. And they have uh, a two millimeter uh, resolution. So now you see that we, we can get um, a pretty good coverage of um, 1D wave data at, at high resolution, high frequency. So there are some interesting um, applications and uh, derived products you can get from that. And these are the key results. Basically, we're going after the drag coefficient in ACIST. Red is our new data. Black is the original uh, Mark Donlan data from 2004. And this was the data that was used to implement uh, the parameterizations in models. And the key takeaways here are that the shape of the data, the general trend, uh, and that is increasing in low to moderate winds up to a certain point and then leveling off. So that's similar. That's good news. However, there is a, there seems to be a consistent bias throughout all wind speeds where uh, the original Donlan data are considerably lower. Uh, to look more into why is that, you know, the, the first uh, baseline comparison is to look at the field data. Field data, uh, so that this is um, uh, compiled by uh, Edson et al. from uh, multiple um, stations in the field. Uh, and field data goes up to about 20 or so meter per second. These last few points are less reliable. Uh, than these points here, simply because the amount of data is highest for uh, the lower wind conditions. And there are fewer points of data for these uh, higher conditions. And the shading is the standard deviation. So now when I look at this, then it tells me, okay, we are kind of in the range of, of field data. So that's encouraging. But then that raises a question, why, why wasn't... Um, the original data from 2004 consistent with the field. And then I look for more data. And so uh, the, the Japanese team, uh, the Kagaki and colleagues, they, they have a few studies on, on dragon waves uh, from, from laboratory. And this basically gives us um, some samples in, in high winds, um, it's, it's really hard to tell. You know, you can't say either one is uh, more correct. We really don't have enough information to say, oh, uh, 
uh, this one is more likely to be good or this one. Uh, it's all in the range of uncertainty. It's encouraging that uh, the Kagaki data in, in low winds are also in agreement with the field data. So that, that, that gave me some confidence that maybe we're, um, we're on the right track, we're not doing something wrong. And then I thought, um, okay, so we're in the same lab that uh, Mark Donlan worked with. We have the original data, we have the original code, so I need to dig through it. And I had to dig through it because I was uh, using Mark Donlan's momentum budget method. Uh, I used uh, his code to make sure that uh, I did all the terms right uh, as, as a sanity check and so on. So I dig into that and I, I found something very interesting, which looked like a source code error in the original code. And the source code error is not in anything dealing with the raw stress data itself, but really in extrapolating the in C2 measured wind speed uh, to 10 meters. Uh, so let me just take you uh, back to this slide. I, I want to point out that typically we cast uh, drag coefficient data onto the 10 meter height and against the 10 meter wind speed. Uh, so this is the standard meteorological measurement uh, height. And for consistency, so various studies take measurements at different heights, but then they cast it to the same sort of standard height, which makes for an easier comparison between different studies. So when they cast um, MC to wind speed to 10 meter height, and same for stress. So once you get U10, then uh, you calculate CD at 10 meter height uh, by dividing friction velocity with wind speed and squaring that. Uh, I found that the array in the MATLAB code that was used um, to, uh, to get at the 10 meter drag coefficient data in the 2004 paper used a different array of winds then were measured in that experiment. They came actually from, from a different data set by mistake. And that data set is uh, shown uh, here in this dash line. So basically there were four data points. Uh, this is wind speed as a function of fan speed in Hertz. Fan speed is just our internal variable. It's a knob uh, that we set the fan. Uh, to run at certain speed, and then we measure wind in the tank and we get what the wind is, given that fan speed. Uh, so the four data points came from uh, a separate set of profile measurements that were part of the same experiment, but different runs. And because of the exp extrapolation, they were considerably higher. Uh, and then this dashed line was used to get get the winds at other fan speeds. However, when I plotted the, the actual measured wind speed from, from that run that the, uh, that the stress was measured in, that's the black line with circles. So you see that it's considerably lower uh, than, than the dash line and the stars. And as a sanity check, we look at mean wind speed from our experiment. They should be same if not uh, if not same, very similar, because we're in the same tank, we replicated, or at least tried as best as we can to replicate the, the conditions, and we get a somewhat lower uh, mean wind speed, but relatively similar. And this is the, the two uh, red lines and symbols are from two different instruments, which gives us confidence. Why is ours a little bit lower? Well, we are at a slightly lower height with the instrument. We're at 29 centimeters, whereas uh, Mark's was at 30 centimeters. So that's probably a negligible difference. Uh, more significant difference is probably that in, back in 2004, the ACES tank, the wind tunnel was recirculating. So the air that leaves the tank would recircling and go around. So it was a closed system. So in a closed system, you preserve some of the momentum. And it's likely that that get, gets you to a little bit uh, higher mean wind. In our current uh, setup, because the ACES tank had to move from the old building, which is now uh, gone to a new building, uh, the tank is not recircling. So the air comes in from outside of the building uh, and leaves outside of the building. 
So my suspicion, and I don't have a confirmation of this, is that we get a bit lower wind speed uh, because of that difference in the tank configuration. Uh, however, it was clear in the source code that I analyzed that this wind speed should have been used but was not when scaling to U10. So what happens when you scale this with a higher value, you get a higher U10, and a higher U10 gets you in the end to a lower CD. It's, once you know that, it's relatively easy to correct in the final data. And again, the raw data um, is good. The, only cor the correction is only applied to the scaling. And then when we do that, uh, then you get uh, this on the right. So on the right panel, uh, the original data is shown and now in dashed and in solid black is the new data. So what happens is that once you correct that scaling, uh, the CD goes up in magnitude and the 10 meter wind goes down in magnitude because now we are using a lower uh, wind speed value for scaling. And now, at least in, uh, in moderate winds, 2004 data is actually in much better agreement uh, with the field data, which uh, gives us another layer of confidence that uh, we're on the right track. And again, so this blue line is the wharf parameterization uh, from 2008 that was used in many, many, many studies. Now, in weather and ocean prediction model, there's a lot of uh, assumptions and, and errors and parameterizations, and there's a lot of error compensations. So, you know, simply improving, moving this line up to fix in the model won't necessarily uh, improve your predictions. Maybe overall, it will change the properties of uh, 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 tropical cyclone intensity, radius of maximum wind, things like that. Uh, but it's, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you're gonna get always a better prediction. However, the key takeaway here is that uh, we need to be very careful when incorporating uh, data just straight into uh, parameterization in models. Uh, not only models have errors, parameterizations have errors, also the data uh, that we use to derive parameterizations can have errors. Um, and so another part of this uh, experiment that didn't uh, make it to the paper is also are also some experiments uh, with paddle uh, paddle waves. So one of the limitations of these uh, tank studies is that patch is, patch is very limited. Uh, so we have about 10 or 12 meter of, of tank, and we're blowing very high wind over initially calm water. So you're limited in what kind of waves you can develop in that environment. And the question is, well, when you blow 30 or 40 meter per second wind over initially calm water, uh, how representative are these waves of the field where you have, you know, 10 to 15 second uh, period uh, waves in front of hurricanes, waves that are tens of meters uh, high, and so on. How well does it scale? Um, and we, we wanted to look at the sensitivity of drag to introducing some background waves. So uh, everything is the same as in the previous runs. Uh, the wind only runs, except that we added these background waves. This is an example image from that side camera imaging, it's a monochromatic wave with one second period and about eight centimeters significant height. And what happens is here in the, in the bottom panel is the significant wave height as function of U10. In red is wind only, which you see increases up to a certain point then saturates. But when you have a paddle wave, uh, it gives much more potential for, for wave growth. In the tank. So now when you have a paddle wave uh, that you add to very high winds, uh, significant wave height can grow up to 25 centimeters uh, in the tank. And then uh, in, in the same momentum budget method, we calculated 
the drag, which are the green values. Uh, it's encouraging that they are all in agreement with the wind only values uh, in relatively low to moderate winds. We don't see large effects of, of background waves there. They're also in agreement with the field data. But as you go up, uh, the drag actually keeps increasing up to a higher level, uh, almost four, and uh, saturates at a higher wind speed. Now, this, um, this looks like a pretty significant and dramatic result. However, I, I need to caution you that this is a monochromatic pedal wave. Uh, waves in the field, uh, and especially in, uh, in, in hurricanes, are far from monochromatic. They're very broad-banded. Uh, this is a relatively high and steep wave. So uh, it's quite possible that uh, we are, uh, what we see here is some unnaturally added roughness that you won't necessarily get in the field in these high winds, simply because the waves are much more broad-banded uh, in Milan, the field. Uh -huh, Milan, go ahead. This is Randy. Um, so are these uh, waves that you add uh, sufficiently steep that you have um, sep separation at, at the, uh, and, and pressure sort of uh, form drag things adding to the, to the drag? I'm sorry, sir. Um, can, can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah, so are, are, are these waves steep enough that, um, that you have uh, separation of the uh, boundary layer uh, at, at the wave and, and therefore some increased sort of form drag pressure effects and so on? It, it, yes, yes, they're, they're definitely steep and I'll, I'll show you some, uh, some images. So even, even in wind only uh, conditions, you get uh, pretty steep waves and I'm, I'm sure there is sheltering. What's, What's unknown is how much it contributes and um, to to the drag, whether whether that solely or something else in addition determines the the saturation and what determines the level, what's the magnitude of drag in that situation. So these are all all open questions. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, this is Stefan Gordy. May, may I ask a question since we stopped here? Uh, just a quick uh -huh. question. When you say that you generated uh, monochromatic waves and you list uh, eight centimeters as a significant wave height, so what was the actual wave height you generated in the tank? From the top of my head, um, I don't know. It's a, it's a little bit higher than this. Um, so I, I need to I need to look and get back to you. But so the way we set up the pedal is really the voltage, and then we we have to measure the wave. Right. So my question is, uh, significant wave height is square root of two times the root mean square wave height. And when you do mm -hmm. periodic waves, the wave height is a root mean square wave height. So to create an eight meter significant wave height, uh, that corresponds to a smaller uh, wave height. Mm. So the, the root mean right. square wave height would be like five and a half centimeters. So there is a conversion when you convert a periodic wave experiments to significant wave height. I just wanted to, you know, ask the question whether you had done that conversion because that would kind of shift your green curve. Uh, correct. However, I, uh, why do you, oh, it would shift the curve if I plotted the amplitude rather than significant wave height. No, if you corrected your silicon wave height, so the, the wave height oh, of a periodic wave is equivalent to the root mean square wave height of an irregular wave, which itself is one over square root of two times the silicon wave height. So there is a 1.4 factor. Mm. Uh, I get it. Uh, I, did that not do the, there. I did not do the conversion. I simply <laughs> did the, the, the spectral uh, integral. Right. Well, you can look at it. So yes, thank, thank you. Very good point. And it's uh, you know in, in uh, coastal engineering experiments, that's how you convert periodic wave experiments to a significant wave height. You know, many. Mm. This, this is kind of the standard thing, but you can you, you know you can prove it with a simple math calculation. So, mm. Thank you. Thank that's you. very helpful. Yeah, I I also have a question. I'm sorry. Does as your significant wave height increases? Does the limit of the height of the tank itself start playing a role in terms of your measurements? 
Okay, so the height of the tank here is uh, 42 centimeters. Uh, so in, in a 25 centimeter uh, significant wave height unconverted, yeah, I would say yes, at, at that point it, it does. In wind only, probably not. So the red curve is, you can safely consider them uh, deep water waves but that's not true for the green one. Okay, and I'm, uh, I'm just gonna show you an application of the side camera imaging and some interesting things that we see in the wave development as a function of fetch and wind. Uh, this is again, the, this is a significant wave height uh, calculated as a, as a spectral integral without any uh, conversion. Uh, the top panel is our wind only experiment and our bottom panel is the wind and paddle uh, together. Uh, y axis is 10 meter wind speed equivalent and X axis is fetch. So from left to right, you have increasing waves. And as you go higher in wind, uh, you also get higher waves. <clears throat> I have indicated with dash lines just for reference uh, hurricane categories. But you, you see how in, when you add paddle waves, uh, you can develop much higher uh, waves simply because you, you, you give, you provide food uh, for the wind to grow waves. Um, but what's interesting is that we, we find two local maxima here. Uh, in about the, the middle of the tank at about six meter uh, fetch, uh, we, we, we find a local, local maximum at about uh, 40 meter per second, 10 meter wind equivalent. But as you go further down fetch, actually the highest winds don't generate the highest waves. So some, something happens here where when you get far enough and with high winds, you actually have uh, intensified dissipation of waves leading to this local minimum. And we can observe some of that from uh, if we look at individual image, so this is a, a photograph of the wave in these from high, high, relatively high fetch, uh, low wind. From this peak, we have mid, mid fetch, high wind. Uh, and you see that this is a very, very steep, uh, steep wave. And these, these waves are also breaking. Uh, there are a lot of uh, smaller waves uh, breaking uh, on this on top of the higher wave. And then when you look at just, uh, just down fetch uh, in same wind speed, you have a much more deteriorated uh, waveform and you see a lot of uh, this, these darker areas are bubbles that are injected under the surface. And you also see it's hard, it's not possible to see it from this image, but um, you can see it uh, in person with your eye that a lot of the, waves are being, uh, let me go back, accidentally move forward. A lot of the waves are, are being uh, trashed directly by wind uh, and spume is being carried away forward. And that's why we have this uh, local minimum. So this is probably mostly like an artifact of very high winds and uh, very steep laboratory waves. But um, it, it does show, um, illustrate this mechanism very well. And this is just a, a, a spectral comparison from uh, relatively moderate wind, higher wind, and then uh, further higher wind and the highest wind. Red is wind only, and the green is with paddle waves. And you see with paddle waves, you have this dominant peak uh, in the spectrum. It's always at uh, one second. However, in wind only, you have the wind sea peak progressively moving to the left, which is down, down frequency, uh, broadening in width. Uh, so broadening la lar largely comes from, uh, from dissipation and some um, wa wave wave interactions. Uh, but the key point here is that uh, the wind sea peak uh, in green in the paddle wave is considerably reduced uh, relative to the red. Uh, 
which means that this dominant wave generated by the paddle is very effective at uh, sheltering uh, shorter waves from the wind. Uh, the black line here is a uh, spectrum from Mark Donald's measurements. We uh, put it here just as a sanity check that we're getting very similar waves. And here we also say from, see from this panel to this panel, we see that the, the dominant wave uh, has actually decreased in, in energy. Uh, and the only way it would do that is uh, uh, by direct uh, impact from wind, because uh, when you simply write, it actually doesn't have, um, doesn't have enough uh, space and time to dissipate that much in the lab. And then our next step is to uh, do the same set of measurements uh, in, the, in the bigger sustained tank. These are the photos from above the tank, uh, under the tank, uh, in action, and what it looks like inside as we're mounting the instruments. And that will give us the opportunity to measure stress and waves at very high winds. We got some preliminary data uh, collected right before COVID. We didn't get enough uh, to carry out uh, the, full, the full experiment that we needed. But I'm happy to say that right now I'm in the process of uh, continuing uh, the experiments in sustain after a long, uh, long break. Uh, but here are some preliminary data of uh, CD. So the data from sustain is uh, in cyan. And I added uh, ACES 2004 corrected for reference in black and our ACES data uh, in red. And these are an example spectra that take you from, this is in C to wind from eight meter per second measured all the way to 43 meter per second wind. So this is measured inside the tank. When you scale it to 10 meter, it's about double. So what we're getting to uh, category five uh, force winds here. And this is wave spectra from, from wave wire at nine meter fetch. And as you go down with wind, you see the winds, windsy peak uh, moving down frequency, uh, broadening, and we, we get very nice spectra, even with this instrument, even in the, in the highest winds. And this is what we're gonna use toward our uh, third part of the project, which is connecting waves and stress. Uh, so we'll, we'll work directly with the wave energy balance, which is what uh, most spectral wave models uh, that are in use today are based on. And, uh, We'll work with Jeffrey's, uh, Jeffrey slash Donlan uh, wave growth function, which has this um, uh, tunable sheltering coefficient, which has been measured many times uh, in the lab and has um, various values depending on which, which study you look at. Um, currently in, in, in our model, this is set as a, either as a constant or a wind speed de uh, dependent curve. But we want to look at how can we based on laboratory data uh, where we can quantify all these terms. We can, we can measure stress, we can measure waves, we can measure wind. Can we back out uh, a functional form of sheltering uh, that will take into account these processes such as intense uh, breaking due to direct impact from wind? Okay, here are my takeaways. Uh, I'm not going to spend more time here. I see that I'm, I'm running a little bit uh, long and I just want to do a, a summary of the continuation of, of this project and adjacent projects. So at this point, I'd like to mention uh, what I call uh, Earth VM. This is still a working title, but it's a new coupling framework uh, for Earth system models. Uh, it's, it's designed as a library rather than an application. So the user gets to write their, uh, their driver so that they have full control over how things will be run and coupled. And uh, this is a successor to the UNCM, which I worked on during my PhD with Shui Chen. Uh, and the few, few key differences and improvements is that uh, we have ditched the exchange grid. Exchange grid is this concept where you interpolate everything from each component 
uh, to that exchange grid, do the physics on the exchange grid, and then go back. Um, it turns out, so the exchange grid adds you basically double taxation uh, for interpolation errors, uh, and also limits uh, the scale at which, so the scale at resolution at which you can run models. It also limits um, in whether you can have one component be very high resolution, the other component very coarse. Uh, so now waves and ocean, for example, will interact directly with atmosphere nests and vice versa, which was previously not possible uh, because of how CERN uh, assumptions in WARF were baked in and how it was implemented. And of course, it will have uh, full coupling physics, um, there's explicit separation of uh, wave growth uh, for wind stress and wave dissipated ocean stress. I know uh, Tetsu and Isaac and um, uh, Yalin Fan did a lot of work on that. Um, and that, that was also insp inspiration for my own work. Um, and also wave and current effects on heat fluxes, which I think is pretty novel. I don't see that uh, in other models being done properly. Of course, Vortex and Coriolis Stokes Force and Langmuir Mixing KPP and will soon be open source and available, which I think is also, uh, also not common uh, for models, uh, but I'd like as many people to be, to be able to use it and improve it. And this is just an example of a coupled simulation of Hurricane Dorian, which we are working on now. So both for this project and for a related project, I'll mention in a bit. And just to give you a taste, this is what the driver code looks like for the fully coupled atmosphere wave ocean model. So you really just set what, what models you want to instantiate, start and stop times, and so on. And you tell it, you tell it how often they, they should run, uh, which component should force or couple with, uh, with other components. So, so it gives you, uh, it gives you a little bit more uh, power and control uh, to, to designing very, very specific uh, coupling experiments. And I'm, so now I'm, now I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and just describe uh, the coastal land air sea interaction experiment. This is a big, um, big field campaign by uh, Professor Brian House, who is the lead and several other teams across government, university, also international institution and industry. And it focuses on the, the key problem is that operational wind forecasts are deficient uh, near the coast. Uh, we, we have, um, we have some idea why is that, uh, because of, uh, processes in the, in the near shore that are not properly resolved, especially in the context of waves and currents, uncoupled weather prediction models don't, don't get these things, don't have, uh, these processes built in, uh, and we need to find ways to improve uh, models in the coastal area. And I'm talking the very near uh, few to several kilometers near the coast. Uh, so basically this, uh, these deficiencies lead to uh, poor wind forecasting, inaccurate current uh, prediction and, and their vertical structure. And likewise for waves. This is just an example of a SAR, um, SAR derived wind field uh, in the northern Monterey Bay, basically showing you how, uh, in this case, you have high variability in wind uh, as, you, as you approach the coast. And this variability is currently not properly resolved by uh, weather models. So this is a five-year project. It will involve uh, multiple uh, field experiments in uh, three locations, Monterey Bay, uh, uh, Northern Gulf of Mexico, and hopefully Hawaii as well. Um, it has a big modeling component by the Navy team from Monterey. Uh, they're running uh, co-amps at very high resolution to, to provide field guidance and also to study this process. And there's also an LES uh, modeling theme, which will really look at the details. Uh, of the processes and the field experiments will involve a large number of instruments in the near shore and 
and offshore aircraft satellite data uh, stations, uh, ground stations at the beach and so on. So I, I mentioned uh, the modeling will guide uh, field experiment will go down to 111 meter resolution uh, and basically involves uh, multiple case studies. Uh, currently with a focus on Northern Mon Monterey Bay. Uh, these are just some examples of boundary layer height and wind, uh, which reveal a very fine, fine scale structure in this region. And so I, I just started uh, working uh, with, with this project and team, uh, and we hope to also add uh, a couple modeling component, not at this high resolution, but uh, at the uh, on the order of one kilometer resolution, but to look at fully coupled processes. So wind wave interaction, wave current interaction, how those affect the wind structure. Uh, another project which is led for by um, Professor Claire Paris um, and collaborators from FAU is an NSF rapid project, uh, which also involves uh, the new coupling framework uh, that that we developed, and basically the key key goal of the project is to look at what are the impacts of of Dorian on Goliath grouper transport and dispersal before, during, and post tropical cyclone passage. And the FAU team uh, basically has a, a lot of uh, field data about uh, the spawning uh, of of the grouper. Uh, before and after the storm. And uh, what we're doing uh, on the UM side, we're producing this very high uh, resolution on the order of one kilometer uh, in the atmosphere and ocean and three kilometers for the waves. Uh, simulation of Dorian and pass 3D uh, current uh, velocities and Stokes drift to a Lagrangian trajectory and dispersal uh, model, which is done with the connectivity modeling system uh, by Claire Paris and Anna Vaz. So basically they're ingesting these high resolution 3D fields and then computing Lagrangian trajectories of Goliath grouper. And these are not just passive, uh, passive advection trajectories, but they involve also uh, biological interactions of, of of individual animals and their own migrations and where they're being taken uh, taken by currents, and basically analyze dispersal of connect, uh, dispersal and connectivity before, during, and after Dorian. Uh, another small project which is related to our uh, main NSF project on dragon extreme winds is a probabilistic analysis of uh, air sea exchange using laboratory numerical experiments. This is um, this is a small travel grant by um, French embassy in the U.S. It's called the Thomas Jefferson Fund, where a U.S. investigator partners with a French investigator. They each get 10k travel money to visit each other and work together. You need to have an existing funded project that this would attach to. So this doesn't pay for, for salary, but it's a really great opportunity for, um, for postdocs to, uh, to get to work with uh, somebody from France and uh, uh, travel there uh, a few times. Uh, they get to visit you. It's, it's, it's really great. Unfortunately, due to COVID, we only had a chance for, uh, for Pierre to visit uh, Miami in January this year. Uh, we got uh, pretty um, good progress done. Um, unfortunately, I, I'm, I'm sad. I, you know, I, I plan to uh, be in France all of October this year, but um, unfortunately, that wasn't possible. Uh, but uh, it is what it is. We uh, we need to move forward the way we can. Uh, and I'm just gonna present to you the main problem. So the idea is that. Weather models resolve increasingly smaller spatial scales and short time scales as we improve with uh, computational capacity. So the operational global models, for example, are approximately about nine kilometer resolution with a time step 
45 seconds. And the research grade regional models are at about one kilometer resolution and time step of five seconds. However, they all still use bulk parameterizations, which are derived from data averaged over 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, and we know that uh, drag depends a lot of, uh, on waves and it has a lot of uh, short time scale variability that is not captured uh, in these long time averages. These long time averages really come from the data being in the field and uh, just taking into account the small scale variability and getting a robust mean value. And that mean value is uh, what's used in current models. This is just an example of drag, default drag coefficient in uncoupled wharf. And this scatter is really only due to uh, thermodynamic instability. But otherwise, it's a, it's a prescribed line function. For a given wind speed, you get one value of, of drag. And that is being used consistently, even if your time step is on the, sh on the order of seconds time scale, you're not resolving processes at the second scale. You're resolving processes over 10 to 20 minute scales. So our goal is to quantify wave-induced uh, stress variability from laboratory and implement a stochastic drag parameterization in the warp surface layer. And I'm just going to give you uh, an illustration of uh, what, what Pierre has done so far uh, with our raw flux data from Sustain. So he started with raw flux data and see how the data is scattered uh, in sort of a vertical groupings and that's simply because we run the fan at a discrete, discrete increment. So we don't get data in between, but you get huge variability in flux at high winds. And uh, you get this variability when you, when you compute the flux averaging over say 10 seconds. That's, that's the representative time scale for the models that we're targeting at. So, he, Pierre does uh, some of his statistical um, uh, methods on this. He normalizes the flux data, he ranks it, uh, and he develops a statistical model, which then allows us to, uh, to sample uh, the flux as function of wind, uh, which, has, uh, which reproduces the distribution of the real data but now allows us to formulate this as a function that we can implement as a, a stochastic model in WARF. And I promise this is the very last uh, project I want to demo. This is a collaboration with uh, Devorte Sosla and Ching Wang from NPS, uh, Nathan Laksag, who is on this call, Victor Bjorkvist from Finnish Meteorology Institute, and uh, my boss, Brand House. Uh, so the main idea is uh, to improve air-sea relative wind speed that is used um, in bulk flux calculation. Uh, recently, it's become more apparent that we can't neglect the ocean current in the bulk air-sea drag. Uh, so that means that rather than doing U10 square, you need to take the relative wind speed. The wind speed is relative to the surface current, or so is thought, but many studies either say you use surface current or, or are not clear what current should be used, or if you only have the current at uh, one meter depth or five meter depth, you just use that. That's what you have, right? Um, uh, however, what's, what is the correct current uh, value to use when you calculate your wind speed relative uh, to the surface? And you really have to consider waves. Like when you have a wavy surface, uh, we know that individual waves of different wavelengths are being uh, carried or advected by effective currents of, diff of different depth layers. Uh, and our question is, okay, like I said, what's the correct uh, current to use in bulk relationships considering uh, wave effects? So to give you an illustration of what a wind drift could look like given different friction velocity values. You see how, so going from up to down, we're decreasing uh, in depth. 
and the wind drift decreases in this case logarithmically that's just based on a simple uh, theoretical model but you know for illustration this could be this dashed line could be the first bin that you get from uh, a bottom mounted uh, ADCP uh, so if you use that uh, in your bulk flux relationship well this is much smaller uh, than the values that are above it and these near surface values these currents are what the currents that carry the shortest waves and the shortest waves carry most of the stress so we really need to take these scales into account when calculating the effective current and if you take uh, a sample spectrum say from either Elfu Haley or Huang and Fua, uh, just as examples. And these are the saturation spectra for different values of friction velocity. So they're parametric spectra, but it gives you some distribution of waves. And then if you uh, make an assumption about a wind input function, you can get a distribution of, of the wave contribution to form drag. So, each of these wave scales contribute uh, different amounts to stress. And this will also, this will depend on the spectrum as well. So if you have the spectrum and if you have the stress, then you can calculate exactly which waves contribute how much to, to stress. And then you can use that to, to integrate the effective current that you should be using in the ball flux relationship. Now these depend on the choice of the wind input function that you choose. So wind input function uh, determines how much flux goes from each, uh, from each wave, how much it contributes. And uh, also these are just uh, examples of, sorry, mistake. Uh, how different spectra and different wind input functions uh, result in a different effective current given different measured uh, friction velocity. So the idea is that if you have measured waves and measured stress, you should be able to calculate accurate and correct effective current to use in your ball flux relationship. And we're getting ready to submit this to JFM Rapids. And at that time, we also plan to have uh, a MATLAB uh, toolbox and a Python library for people to use in their work. And finally, I will uh, end here. Thank you so much for having me and staying so long. And I'll take any questions. Thank you, Milan, for sharing your interesting research works and the projects with us. Uh, we have time for some questions. So first, uh, I, I'd like to ask uh, if there's any question from the students, you can go ahead and unmute. Uh, so it looks like there is no question from the students. So if anyone have any question, feel free to ask. Uh, can I hear me? Yes. yes. Yes, this is Ted Sahara. Anyway, so thank you very much for a very, very interesting uh, thank you. Uh, presentation. And we're looking forward to this results from the new tank. And one of the things I was wondering is uh, to get the drug coefficient, you have to make some assumptions about the wind profile to convert from your measured wind speed to 10 meter height. And mm -hmm. I think the wind profile in the tank is far from logarithmic because Number one, you don't have constant stress layer in the tank. And right. number two, I think when you are near the surface, I think the wind profile itself is modified by waves, which I think uh, those two combined. So I was curious whether you have actually measured the wind profile, wind, wind profile in the tank and see how they look like. Great question. So yeah. obviously this, this came in, in our, for our data in ACES. So when going to to the surface the surface stress and then extrapolating the 10 meter we need we needed to account for that uh yes definitely in the tank uh stress is far from constant and the wind profile is far from uh 
logarithmic. In ACEST, we simply use the measurements uh, that Mark Donlan took, uh, the, the profile, his profiles, uh, to make that correction. So basically, it involves, in general, in the tank, stress decreases with height. Yep. So somewhere in the center line, it's much lower than, uh, than closer, uh, closer to the surface. Right. And so we need to make that, uh, that correction when we're comparing stress with, say, other, other experiments. Right. Uh, we have not measured uh, the profiles in sustain yet. That was actually our next item to do uh, right before uh, COVID started. And I'm happy to say I'm doing that right now. So in, in, uh, in this picture, the, do you see my pointer? Yep. So there's a bar, vertical bar here in the, in the center of the tank. And on that, on that bar, we're mounting uh, the hot film anemometer uh, alongside with, uh, with a piton anemometer that is uh, going to measure stress at various heights. So right. we do need to do that measurement very good. Yeah. And then uh, we also have here alongside on the right side, we have nine pressure ports uh, to measure static pressure. So then when we have delta tau del z, uh, vertical stress gradient, we also measure del p del x, uh, the along tank pressure gradient. It turns out from the, from the momentum balance that the two are nearly linearly related. So once you measure the, the profile and the del p del x and get the relationship, then you can go on and simply measure stress and pressure gradient uh, to get uh, to get to that correction. Great. Can I ask another question about the tank, uh, Stefan mm -hmm. Curling? So you showed a momentum balance where you have a bottom shear stress term there, and then especially the, the small tank, you showed a picture that the tank has a lot of sidewall surface. So I assume you made a correction for uh, the friction on the sidewalls in your balance. So that, that's the first question. The second question, yeah, here, the Tabi. The second question is about the, when you have waves, you should also that there was a sloping beach at the end of the tank and even the best beaches, they still have some inflection, it could be as much as 10%. Mm -hmm. So that may artificially increase the sea state uh, in your tank when you're making measurements. So the question was, did you measure the reflection coefficient of your beach? First question about bottom stress and sidewalls. No, um, we did not. We did not measure uh, stress from the sidewalls. We also did not assume anything about it other than that we neglected it. So the bottom stress we measured about four centimeters from the bottom, uh, and the sidewalls were about. Uh, so the t that tank is one meter wide. Uh, so yes, there is some side side uh, side friction. We simply neglected here, but it could be larger than the bottom friction, uh, judging by the, the wetted surface area. So if you if you increase your tall B term, then mm -hmm. that affects your uh, calculation of the surface drag. Yes, that's true, but I don't know. Why do you think that the side stress would be higher than the bottom stress? Because it's proportional to their wetted surface area. So the, the tonal force, this is a balance of force you're doing mm -hmm. uh, in a free body diagram. So the equation is okay if you, are, uh, if you don't have lateral boundaries. All right. But if you have solid lateral boundaries, you have additional forces there, which are just additional shear stresses when, when uh, calculated. So I, I, I think, you, you know, evaluating how big they are would be, I guess, important uh, because the whole thing is based on the balance. And that also works if you don't have waves, you know, if, you, if your radiation stress term is not there, you still have um, a current and, and right. some, some stresses on solid surfaces, no flow right. boundary conditions. 
Okay, that that's a good point. So I will I will for sure think more about the side stress problem. So the, the bottom stress that we measure is about half percent of the total tau. And okay, so if the side stress could be higher, although so you said it's a higher wetted area. Um, I think it's about equivalent. So we have two sides that are about, um, so they're 42 centimeter height at, at rest. And the tank is one meter wide. So, mm -hmm. so they're, they're about the same. They're, they're similar size, I would say. So it could be another 1%. Yeah, it, it could be. Yes, that's true. I mean, it's, um, it's small corrections, but I think you, you probably have the data to make that correction. Yes, yes. So, I mean, any, any correction that we have the data to make, we should, absolutely. Uh, but I also want to point out, so in the momentum budget, so we had, although Mark Donnellan didn't include any error bars, the data don't, don't have it. Uh, we were able to, cal to to propagate all the instrument errors through the equation to get to the the standard deviation error mm -hmm. of our uh, momentum budget. So in in low winds, because the the dominant term is the mean mean slope and the pressure gradient, uh, the balance of the two. So when you have very low winds, the slope is very small. And you're approaching instrument, basically instrument yeah, error for the yeah. for, for the yeah. elevation. So this bar is very high in low winds, uh, but as you go higher in wind, the slope increases, and the errors uh, decrease. Um, so, yeah, I I agree that we should consider uh, the side stress. I'm not too concerned about it. Simply knowing that all the so all the the measurements that go into getting the tau here have their own uncertainties. Mm -hmm. So it would probably be, uh, we're, we're already quite uncertain, uh, to put it that way. And then the question about wave reflection of uh, the bottom slope? Oh yeah, uh, no, we did not. So we, yeah, we did not uh, measure uh, the reflection. I, you know, I can, I can see some in low winds and, and paddle wave. Uh, in wind only uh, waves, I couldn't see any reflected waves uh, with my eyes. I'm, I'm sure there are some, uh, we know that we get them, but no, I, so I will, I will look into. You could at least, uh, the paddle waves do an experiment without wind and put multiple wave gauges and there are methods to calculate incident and reflected wave spectra. That's mm -hmm. called the Mansour and Funke method. It's been around for 20 years. So you, you can actually, okay. if you don't have an input of energy, you can, um, you can calculate precisely the reflection coefficient for regular or irregular waves. Hmm. I, I can send you references if you are that, interested. That would be great. I'm very interested. Mm -hmm. Thank I you. Realize. But it's very interesting work. I'm, you know, by, by no means this is, you know, the devil is in the detail in all these things. So it's, it's just important to make sure all the I yeah, are dotted. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to ask a quick question. Can, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, Milan. So I um, have several questions, but for the sake of time, I just I wanted to ask you one question. Uh, you probably know that uh, there have been some estimations of the drag uh, from the ocean measurements uh, based on momentum budget. And, uh, mm -hmm. and it seems like most of them indicate that the drag coefficient should go down in high wind conditions. And this is what we have implemented into the operational H-WARF model uh, several years ago. And also you're familiar with Alex Solovio of uh, Kel Kelvin mm -hmm. Helmut yeah. the stability theory. So, but the, the, your data essentially don't show any noticeable decrease of the drag. So I'm just wondering what you think about that. I don't know. So uh, there's two things. Yes, our, our data don't show decrease. Uh, and we have to remember that this is a lab. Um, 
we don't we don't not quite know how well this translates to the field. It certainly informs. Um, I'm, I'm I would personally not be confident on implementing either uh, a flat line or a decreasing drag as a one to one function. Uh, so a lot of a lot of these so both air side and, and ocean measurements. Uh, they, they show, they, they give an error bar on in the high in the high winds. Mm -hmm. Let me let me pull up a more relevant slide. Okay. So, okay, th these are relatively low here, but um, especially ocean side measurements. So, so these bars. Uh, mm -hmm. So, for example, the work from uh, Thomas Sanford and. Uh, Eric Dasaro and right, right. Uh, the Sea Blast data, they all show very high uncertainty in the, yes, they show a decrease and, and high uncertainty in the data. They're indirect measurements. So I think there is, it's a signal to something. Uh, I don't feel confident that uh, a decrease is the definitive uh, answer. Uh, right now, I, I I tend to believe that it you know in in very high winds you could have a decrease and you could have uh, higher values and that, that's so that's what we see also again from the lab so that's uh, relatively limiting in comparing it to the field but we see very high variability uh, in stress from the lab, so which, okay. So as we go up, the spread tends to increase. Uh, um, another, another limitation of the ocean side measurement. So I mentioned they're very indirect, so you need to do a a momentum budget thing and usually have only a few floats mm -hmm. uh, there. Uh, a hurricane goes over and you, you sample only a few points or a few lines uh, in, inside the hurricane. So yeah, I, I don't have a, a strong, I don't have a strong opinion either way. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, no, still, yeah I, choose, I choose to say I don't know. Yeah, important question. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. So before we go, I just want to announce the name. So we have five students who are interested to get a free copy of Milan's newly published book on modern Fortran. <laughs> so thank you, Milan, for sharing this book with us and the students. Right. I'm going to announce the name. So Victoria... Uh, she, she, she showed interest in getting a copy of this book. Uh, Jong San, Il Kyung, and Shen Yu. And finally, it's me. <laughs> so I'm also very interested. So I also put my name there. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you for sharing this book with us. And if you'd like to um, say anything like before we go. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. Thank you for having me. And uh, keep, keep measuring and keep computing. <laughs> Thank you, Milan.